Good afternoon, my friends. Welcome to Wonderful Wednesdays, our touch point where we talk about the PMP exam and I hold you accountable and I make sure you're doing what you should be doing because that's why you employed me. You got to remember it's an employment for me. Okay. Without you, I wouldn't have a job. So thank you for giving us a job to help you prepare effectively for your PMP exam. Now, today we're going to be taking a look at the chapter that the Saturday class is on, because that's how we roll. But today we've got a special treat. We've got our PMP guru who got certified a few days ago in the building, the virtual building. We've got Holly here. Holly's going to be speaking to us at the end of the meeting. So even though you see her online, she's technically not here <laughs> until the end. So at the end, she'll be sharing with us a few tips, tricks, and ideas. But for now, I would like to take a look at the queue and see who is here. So we have Abby and Bosse and Carolyn and Chris, Dinesh, Ken, Margaret, Muzaffar, Sonia, and Tony. So welcome all of you. I hope you're doing well. Why don't you put a chat in the chat box and let me know what you've been doing this past week towards your PMP. Just chat in to me. Let me know which chapters you've covered. If you've covered chapters 1 to 13, just say that. If you're still on chapter 1 or 2, that's fine. I ain't mad. I just want to know what you've been up to. That's all. So if you can kindly chat in, that will be awesome. Ah. Very good, Dinesh. So Dinesh, it sounds like what you need to be doing when we get done with procurement and stakeholder on Saturday, you need to be going for a second, a second round or a second dose, so to speak. Second dose of PMP exam fun. And that's how it should be done. It should be done in layers, add layers upon layers upon layers, right? For those of you who are still subscribed to the Prazion Learning Management System, I just want to speak to that very quick. So let me share this part of the screen while you folks still continue to chat in where you're at in your studying. But if you take a look at the screen here, the Prazion Learning Management System, for those of you still subscribed to it, when you go in, you have a number of accountability blocks. The first one is, of course, the PMP exam prep camp. So let me click on that. For those of you that have not watched the videos, you should be watching the videos. And you should be taking the quizzes at the end of each chapter, you know, because that is a prerequisite for you to finish this course to at least take all of those quizzes and get a 70 or greater. And at the bottom here, we have Agile. We have the PMP Champions Lessons Learned. We have what I call the PMP Exam Failure Avoidance Scheme which is another module to prepare you for the exam. But then we have these mock exams. You see the mini mock exam. Guess who's going to be taking the mini mock exam next week? You Saturday folks. This is the exam I expect you to take and use that to close the gaps. And then the week after that, the week of whatever it is, my expectation is you're beefed up enough to face the final mock on the 8th of August. So those of you on Saturdays, we're going hard on tech camp and all this stuff. But once all that is over, as soon as we get done on the 8th, my expectation is for you to be able to take these mock exams. And then we have a CAPM mock exam right at the bottom for CAPM students. You know what? For those of you like Dinesh, Dinesh, I would, I would advise like a cap and mock like this. Just jump in there, take it. It's a cap and mock. And my expectation is for you to at least be able to conquer it. And from there, the next thing will be to take the mini mock after the mini mock, then this one. All right. So if you've not been playing in the learning system, you're missing out on a large part of your preparation, you know. Taking these quizzes is what I expect you to do at the end of every week. Once we've covered a chapter, I expect you to come in here and face the quiz and take the quiz. 
All right. Now, going back to courses, there are other materials here. There's the 2020 vision quizzes. Now, these 2020 vision quizzes are quite savage. They're very aggressive. The questions are not that easy. I want to recommend again, take these quizzes as a double helping. So those of you that have been quietly evading taking these quizzes, you need to face them squarely like this week, all right? A knowledge area a day, a quiz a day. Why haven't you, like this, this is such a savage one. Why haven't you taken it? The drag and drop and select all that apply, those are in chapters one, two, and three. But beyond that, you have even more challenging questions. Like stakeholder 2020 is notorious for making people feel they don't know anything. And I don't want you to feel like you don't know anything, but I want you to find gaps. And it's good. It's okay to find gaps. Some of you freaking out that you found gaps. There's no need to freak out. Don't freak out. Just close the gaps. The freak out should come when you didn't close the gaps and tomorrow is your exam. That's when you should freak out. So for my friends who have been taking the marks, Muzafai got your email before I jumped on. Thank you very much. Good job with all of those marks you've been taking and everyone else who's been taking these marks and these quizzes. This is what I expect. This is the only way that you're going to bulletproof your success on the exam is by taking these over and over again. Going back to the list of courses, you can see we've got the 2020 mock exam. We've got the challenge knowledge area quizzes, which is a second dose of knowledge area quizzes. So actually a third dose. So you've got the prep camp, you've got the 2020s, and you've got these, which are so ridiculously long. Some of the questions are so, so long, but it's going to help you. It's going to help you beef up your stamina. You see a question like this. From the little discussion we had with Brittany last week, you remember what she said? She said, oh, a question like that? That's normal. This long. You get what I'm saying? So the more you face them, the more you're getting ripped, you're getting jacked, you're getting strong. And when the time comes for you to knock out the test, you will. You will knock it out. All right? But you got to be coming here to practice, to play in the sandbox. All right. I want you to get certified and forget that this place ever existed, except when you're telling your friends about it. But I, I want you to get certified quick and leave it alone. Get certified quick and leave it alone. How do you get certified quick? Go into the PMP, Pembok Guy Gym daily. Some of you have been escaping. Some of you have not been doing your leg days. You're like, oh, I don't want to read the ITTOs. I don't want to read 686. Read it. Okay, read it and, and then I'll stop yelling at you when you get certified. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. All right, my friends. So let's see what we have in our queue or in our chats. I saw some chats scurry by. So let's see. Sonia says, I went through. All, oh, yes, Sonia, I got your email. Thank you. Hopefully we can take a look at those. But I, I didn't want to spoil the experience for those who haven't done it. So I, I, I haven't been able to hide the answers, which could be a problem. We'll see how it goes. If, I, if we don't do it today, then we'll do it next week, okay? But I'll, I'll endeavor to go through them really quick if I can, and I'll try to hide the answers. All right. So Boss has read to chapter 10. Very good. Carolyn's listening to recordings. That helps as well. Keep listening to it. Hey, Audio Digest. You got to download. Why aren't you listening to it? Why? You should be listening to it like round the clock. Whether you're working in the garden, whether you're doing chores around or you're driving in your car, hopefully you found a way of getting that thing on your phone, your device, getting it to play. So I'm just going to ask, um, there were some folks who said they didn't have the audio and they did not request it again. If you want us to resend it to you, maybe you don't have it, you got to send an email to support at praiseon.com. We will resend it to you. But you're missing out. If you're not using your audio digest, the MP3, download 20 hours, you're missing out. All right. Very good. Chris is eating the Pembok for the second time. 
Muzaffa is doing the glossary. Uh, Jackie, I believe that is, just arrived. Dinesh, <laughs> Dinesh said, very aggressive, the 2021s. They're very aggressive, but they're going to make you tough. They're going to make you be able to stare the exam in the eye and say, so what? Who are you? I can take you out right now and take it out. Boom. That's what it's all about. It's getting so strong, so confident, being able to tackle any amount of volume that the PMI throw at you, four lines long, five lines long, whatever, you're able to tackle it. That's where I want you to get to. Pedro says, how do you combine the audios into one? Honestly, I do not know. That is, that is beyond my technical abilities. All I know is that if you have all of the audio selected on a computer and you hit enter, it will open up the device of choice and play, but I'm not sure in which order it will play. Okay. Yes, just keep preparing more, Dinesh. Very good, Jackie. Keep going over the ITTOs, closing the gaps, doing what you should. Awesome. All right, let's go over to our chapters for today. Today we're covering the procurement chapter, but of course not the whole thing. I'm just giving you the top of the waves. We went over it at a high level. Those of you on Saturdays, um, I want to go over the contract types a little bit more, and we're going to have another dose of this with the Saturday folks. But you do know that on Vimeo, all of this stuff is covered in a lot of detail. So let's talk about procurement real quick. Procurement is all about managing contracts. That's the summary. And in managing contracts, you need to first assess, do we need a contract? Do we need to buy something? That's the first thing. And if you do, then you decide which contract type to, purchase, to use to purchase. So in procurement management, we have three processes. Planned procurement management. This one is notorious for being the process with the largest number of unique outputs. Very notorious indeed. Keep your eye on it because it has seven unique outputs and it has a strange appearance of change requests. That you do not want to miss. Seven unique outputs and a strange appearance of change requests. Why do I say strange? Because you are in planning. You don't see change requests in a lot of planning processes. So there are some things you want to take note of when it comes to plan procurement management. So let's look at plan procurement management and let me point out to you the seven unique outputs. All right, here are your seven unique outputs. The seven unique outputs, procurement management plan, procurement strategy, bid document, procurement statement of work, source selection criteria, make or buy decisions, and independent cost estimates. You got to remember all of these are from this process. They are unique to plan procurement management. Now, in a nutshell, the procurement management plan guides you on how to go about the procurement processes. This plan tells you how to conduct procurements and how you would control procurements at a high level. Now, once the contract is signed, everything becomes clearer, the terms, the conditions, then you might even end up updating this in conduct procurements. But for now, it's a high level this is how we're going to control and manage the procurement. If you've been there before and it's a very similar procurement, you might have a more detailed procurement management plan. But I expect this to be updated on some projects when you gain more clarity as to what contract you're going to be working with. The procurement strategy is very specific to the overarching payment approach to paying the vendor and the delivery method of the contract. And I should also say it guides you on these construction contracts. It guides you on whether you're going to be using a design build, a design bid build, a build, own, operate, transfer, and stuff like that. So if you haven't taken note of page 
476, the delivery methods talked about on page 476, pay close attention to them because here we talk about professional services, whether there's going to be a middleman. And then we talk about construction where there could be a middleman that is consulted to deal with the vendor or the seller. This is not talked about in enough detail as I would have liked, but nonetheless, the PMI, they make mention of the design build, design bid build, and so on. This is not in the PMBOK guide. For that reason, I am going to save what is on the screen. I'm going to share it in the chat. If you are not able to see these pop-ups in Zoom, you're not going to be able to download it. So I'm going to ask you to ask a friend to share it with you. But here we go. It's a screenshot. And here you can see the different types of contracts that were mentioned. Now, these are not the wide three contract types, fixed price, cost reimbursable, and time materials. No, it's not those. These are specific to construction. All right. I would not expect this to appear on your cap M, but who knows? So design build under this method, an owner typically hires a single entity, the design builder to perform both the design and construction. Design bid build, this is a most traditional process in the US construction industry where the owner contracts separately with a designer and a contractor. And then we have the turnkey contract. Definition of turnkey is an arrangement under which a contractor completes a project, then hands it over in fully operational form to the client, which needs to do nothing but turn the key, as it were, to set in motion. And the last one here, boot, build, own, operate, transfer. Also mentioned in the PMBOK guide very vaguely, but here I try to give you some more content about it. It's a form of project delivery usually for large-scale infrastructure projects wherein a private entity receives a concession from the public sector or the private sector on rare occasions to finance, design, construct, own, and operate a facility stated in the concession contract. This enables the project proponent to recover its investment, operating, and maintenance expenses in the project. So if the government hires a vendor, a seller, a contractor to build something, they may very well give them a contract to build, own, operate it for a while. They make the money back and then they transfer it over to the government or whichever entity. So these are not talked about a lot in the PMBOK guide, but it's definitely worth noticing. These are talked about again under the procurement strategy, page 476. Okay. So remember what we're doing here. This is planned procurement management. And it says, once the make or buy analysis is complete and the decision is made to acquire from outside the project, a procurement strategy should be identified. The objective of the procurement strategy is to determine the project delivery method, the type of legally binding agreements, and how the procurement will advance through the procurement phases. And there we've got delivery methods, we've got contract payment types, and we've got procurement phases. Now, talking about contract types, this is mentioned under organizational process assets, page 471. So I want us to very briefly cover this just to give you some ideas about these contract types. So why is it under organizational process assets? Because the processes and procedures for contracting are contained in there. And if the company says, the contracts we're going to execute must all be fixed price or time and materials or something like that, then you've got to follow the OPA. So OPAs is where you can get an idea of the contract type to use. All right. So the organizational process assets, as you can see on the screen, we have the pre-approved seller list. You can see we have existing formal and informal procurement related policies. You can see we've got management systems and a multi-tier database or system of pre-qualified sellers based on prior experience. Now let's talk about the contract types themselves. Depending on the nature of the project, depending on what you're working on, 
certain contract types may be preferred over others. It really depends on what you're working on and your firm. But the bottom line is a contract is a legally binding document between buyer and seller. All right, there are three types of fixed price contracts. We're gonna look at fixed price first. Looking at fixed price contracts, we have firm fixed price. In firm fixed price, it's just that, nothing changes. There is no wiggle room for any change whatsoever because it's firm and it's fixed and it's not changing. The second one is fixed price incentive fee. Now this could be a number of possibilities depending on how much of the incentive fee you win. If you win some of the incentive fee, you're gonna end up making more. If you don't make any of the incentive fee, of course you will not. So this has a little bit of variability in it, even though it's fixed price. The place to use an FPIF is when you want to incentivize the big I. When you want to incentivize a seller, you use a fixed price incentive fee. You see? Last one here is fixed price with economic price adjustment, FP-EPA. The place to use this is when there are fluctuations. You might want to use this in your favor. You could also find this being used when you're working with an entity that is just fair in their dealings. They may choose to use an FP-EPA because they know that the products that you need to purchase are fluctuating in the marketplace. For example, the cost of copper for wiring and things like that. So let's read on page 471, it says, this type is used whenever the seller's performance period spans a considerable period of years, or if the payments are made in a different currency. It is a fixed price contract, but with a special provision for allowing for predefined final adjustments to the contract price due to change conditions, such as inflation changes, or cost increases or decreases for specific commodities. So that's fixed price. Those are the three, all right? You gotta read them on your own and get really good with them, all right? So FFP, firm fixed price, most favored by buying organizations. There's least risk here for this, the buyer because the buyer is gonna fix the price. It will not fluctuate and the risk is less in this type of contract. In fact, it's the least risky of all the contracts. Now, when we move into FPIF, not to say there's risk, but when we talk about uncertainty, there's more uncertainty with an FPIF because if the seller wins all of the incentive fee, then of course you gotta part with more money, but at least you got what you were trying to get from it. So FPIF, it gives the buyer and seller flexibility. If the seller does a good job, then they should be rewarded for the good job. Now, this could go into a lot of annoying detail with some trainers because they introduce a topic which in my mind is very obsolete as far as the formula behind it. But this is not for the CAPM. This is more for the PMP. It's called a point of total assumption. So imagine a point in which even if you won the incentive fee, you would still lose. That's the point of total assumption. And it's peculiar to fixed price incentive fee contracts. Now, what you need to remember about the point of total assumption is just this. I don't want to make it more laborious than it needs to be. The point in the cost curve where the seller no longer realizes any profits from the endeavor. In other words, You've blown through all of your potential profits. Even the incentive fee that you could have won will make no difference because you are so far gone in spend. That is a point of total assumption. Again, it's not in the PMBOK guide, but you'll see me mention it in the video. And the last one we talked about, FP-EPA. You want to remember this is used for long, multi-year contracts. All right? So that's fixed price. Let's go to the next one. The next type of contracts are cost reimbursable. Take a close look. Under cost reimbursable contracts, we have cost plus fixed fee, cost plus incentive fee, and cost plus award fee. Now, it is ethical, especially in government space, you see them telling you it has to be a cost reimbursable contract. Why? Because they very well know they have no idea about the full gamut of work to be done. 
they got an idea about the scope, but it's not firm. And it is considered unfair to run a fixed price contract when even the buyer has very little idea of the scope. So it is not impossible to find people actually encouraging you to use this to cover their basis because sellers and vendors have been known to sue when they take a fixed price contract and it blows them out of existence. There have been some contractors that are no more. Their business is no more because they took on a fixed price contract and it ate them right into the hole. So cost reimbursable contracts sometimes are the best one to do, especially if the scope of work is not known. So beware, it is not always good to choose a fixed price contract, especially when you know that the scope of work is unknown. The scope of work has variability, even as the buyer. Very important you realize that. So in cost reimbursable contracts, the buyer pays the seller for defined allowable incurred costs. An estimate of total cost is determined. The seller has to hold cost within the estimate unless otherwise approved by the buyer. It enables flexibility and is less risky for the seller than the fixed price contract. So in other words, the risk is more for the buyer in these types of contracts. So we've got cost plus fixed fee. The summary is you have the cost reimbursed for allowable expenses, for allowable expenses, <laughs> not just any expense. You don't want to do what a buddy of mine did in a construction firm. He went out to do some work on this site and when evening came, he felt bored and he wanted some entertainment. So he decided to watch a bunch of movies and when time came for submitting the invoices, here he is giving the DOD an invoice with movies listed. They said, no, we took a closer look at the receipt from the hotel. This buddy was for a movie. We ain't paying for it. So it's for allowable costs, my friends. Allowable cost, cost plus fixed fee. Now, one thing to remember about this fixed fee, the fee is fixed, not based on your final cost. It is fixed based on the projected estimated cost at the beginning. So for people who think, oh, I can run up this big old bill and then I get a percentage of that as the fee. No, you don't. So let's read what the PMI says here about cost plus fixed fee. Page 472, it says, the seller is reimbursed for all allowable costs for performing the contract work and receives a fixed fee payment calculated as a percentage of the initial, watch the word initial, estimated project cost. Fee amounts do not change unless the project scope changes. All right. So pay close attention to that minutia there for CPFF. The next one, CPIF, cost plus incentive fee, it's pretty straightforward. You set the gauntlet, you tell them, this is what I want you to achieve. If they achieve it, then you split a difference, for example, in terms of budget, or if there are other scheduled targets, it's very clear what they're going to get if they meet it. Let's read very quick on page 472. It says, cost plus incentive fee. The seller is reimbursed for all allowable costs for performing the contract work and receives a predetermined, again, you see that? Like the word initial, this is a predetermined incentive fee based on achieving certain performance objectives as set forth in the contract. In CPI contracts, if the final costs are less or greater than the original estimated cost, then both the buyer and seller share cost from the departures. In other words, the difference. They split the difference somehow based on a pre-negotiated cost sharing formula. For example, 80-20. So if you saved $100, you split it 80-20. They take $80, you take 20. And it's in your interest to save them money. You see how it works? So psychological games there. You know, they know that you want to keep the costs low if you're going to get some of the costs you saved. So it's not a bad contract, and I think it's quite fair. The last one, CPAF, cost plus award fee, page 472, it says, the seller is reimbursed for all legitimate costs, but 
the majority of the fee is earned based on the satisfaction of, you might want to highlight this, certain broad subjective performance criteria. Beware of contracts with broad and subjective performance criteria. If they wake up on the wrong side of the bed, they may choose not to give you that award fee. And it's not subject to appeals, as you can read there. The determination of the fee is based solely on the subjective determination of seller performance by the buyer and is generally not subject to appeal. So you want to beware of that. All right. So the summary of these next three, we've talked about CPFF, cost plus fixed fee. You've got to remember it's fixed and it does not change except the scope changes. If the scope changes, then of course the fixed fee will be renegotiated. The next one we talked about was CPIF, and you've got to remember the split. As you can see here on the screen is an example. Pre-negotiated cost share ratio is 60-40. This means the buyer takes 600K while the seller takes 400K if there's a million at stake. So a million under budget means you're going to split it 60-40 Buyer takes sixty percent, you take forty percent. So it's in your interest to save money. You get what I'm saying? And there are other incentives that could be built in. And last but not least, CPAF, the seller is reimbursed for legitimate costs, but it's a very subjective award fee. All right. The final one to talk about is time and material T and M. This contract incorporates both a fixed price component and a cost reimbursable component, depending on organizational policies. TNM contracts may have imposed not to exceed values similar to fixed price contracts. Unit labor, material rates, and seller profit could be preset. And I've been in these kind of contracts before. They give you a not to exceed value. They tell you you cannot exceed this amount of hours or this amount of money in a time period. And when you cap that amount, at least you don't have to work because it's already been decided you shouldn't. So you leave it alone to the next period. And that's TNM. TNM is not bad when you're doing staff augmentation. Let's read real quick. Page 472, it says, the second line towards the end, TNM contracts are often used for staff augmentation, acquisition of experts, and any outside support when a precise statement of work cannot be quickly prescribed. So you've got no SOW, use a TNM. Make it up as you go along. No one's going to get hurt. So that's the bottom line with contracts. And of course, I've got a question to ask you regarding procurement management. So let's jump into a few questions. All right, here's your poll. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about it. Let me give you a minute to think about it. I'll let you read it yourself, and I'll see what's in the chat. A uh, good question from Michelle here. I will answer that at the end. Thank you for the chat. One minute. All righty then, three, two, and one. Let's end the poll and let's share the results. And everyone has gone for C. Let's find out why. It says, you cannot provide a precise statement of work because the work is still in discovery mode and the enormity of work 
cannot be quickly prescribed. Great job. The answer is indeed C. So one of the questions that came in from Michelle is, so does delivery method impact the contract types? Well, let's read what the PMBOK guide says. Let's go to page 476 and let's read on the contract payment type. So it says, contract payment types are separate. Oh, they are separate from the project delivery methods and are coordinated with the buying organization's internal financial systems. They include, but are not limited to these contract types plus variations, lump sum, firm fixed price, cost plus award fee, cost plus incentive fee, time and material, target cost, and others. And then it goes through all the pieces, but let's read fixed price contracts are suitable when the type of work is predictable and the requirements are well-defined and not likely to change. Cost plus contracts are suitable when the work is evolving, likely to change or not well-defined. Incentive and awards may be used to align the objectives of buyer and seller. So think about it, you're working with a vendor and you've barely even got the design down. You don't even know what the building's gonna look like. You got a hazy idea. Well, it wouldn't make sense to use a fixed price contract for that. That's why you would use a cost reimbursable contract. So what you are delivering rather than the delivery method affects the contract type. Another example is if you're delivering a million pens to an office for the government, the million pens, well-defined, know the cost, know the price, done it a gazillion times for other firms, then of course you know it's going to be a fixed price contract. So it's really what you are delivering that affects the contract more than the delivery method. And as PMI says, we want to think about these as two different things. They really are different. Okay, so it's what you are delivering, what you are producing, and how it's been disseminated. Like in the world of Agile, if you are offering value ever so often, but the precise value you're delivering is done in increments and sprints, it would make sense to use a fixed price contract. All right, so it's really what you're delivering that affects it more. Very good question. All right, so why is PS not built into the PM plan and is a separate document? So things like that, I just leave them alone because that's the PMI's world. A strategy though, a strategy is an overarching mindset. It's not how you're gonna do it necessarily. So the strategy of how it's going to be delivered is really what this is versus the strategy of how the contract will be managed. But when I get PMI taking a particular stance about something, I leave them alone. I don't argue with them. It's their ball. It's their court. It's their exam. So whatever they say, I don't argue with it because honestly, there's a lot of stuff in the Pembroke guy that's arguable, a lot of it, but I just let it slide. But in this instance, the strategy is more like an overarching idea of how something will be delivered versus how the contract will be managed. All right. How the contract will be managed is different. All right. So here's another question for you. I'll give you one more and then we'll move on to stakeholder and then we'll have enough time to hear from Holly. All right. So here is your poll relaunched. The most commonly used contract type is the dash. This is so easy, like a two second question. But I'll be kind, I'll give you a minute. All righty, three, two, and one. Let's end the poll. Thank you for the chats. Let's share the results. And majority of us have chosen A, 
that is because it really is a it's fixed firm fixed price okay that is a most commonly used one firm fixed price not fixed price incentive fee very few people are gracious to give an incentive okay all right so to finish off procurement let me give you a reminder of some of the other bits and pieces in procurement and then we wrap this up all right so we talked about plan procurement management the next process is conduct procurement. And what you need to focus on here is contract award. In conduct procurement, the contract is awarded. And you also have negotiating and advertising and bidder conferences and all sorts of things happening here. Finally, we have control procurement. And this is where you are managing the vendor relationships with you. It's very important to remember it's management of the contract, but it's in control procurement. Something else you want to remember in control procurement is that we have an output known as closed procurement. You get what I'm saying? Closed procurement. You want to close the procurement. It's kind of counterintuitive because a lot of us are used to seeing things that rhyme with the process group we're in. So we're in monitoring and controlling, you wouldn't have expected to see something called closed procurements, but it is there as closed procurement. So let me give you a quick reminder. Here are the outputs of control procurements and you can see the very first one listed is closed procurements. Keep that in focus, my friends, especially on the exam. So let's read closed procurements and we'll be done with this. If you go to page 499, it says the buyer, usually through its authorized procurement administrator, provides the seller with formal written notice that the contract has been completed. So that's really what it is, formal written notice that it's done. It says requirements for formal procurement closure are usually defined in the terms and conditions of the contract and are included in the procurement management plan. Typically, all deliverables should have been provided on time and meet technical and quality requirements. There should be no outstanding claims or invoices. All right, so you can see this is quite voluminous stuff. I mean, we spent pretty much 35 minutes, 40 minutes, almost the entire time for the meeting talking about contract types. You see, talking about contract types. So let's go over to our next knowledge area before our time is totally up. We're gonna be talking about stakeholder management next. In stakeholder management, the part that I feel we should talk about more than the others is identify stakeholders. So a quick recap, what exactly is stakeholder management? Stakeholder management includes the processes required to identify people, groups, or organizations that could impact or be impacted by the project, to analyze stakeholder expectations and the impact on the project, and to develop appropriate management strategies for effectively engaging stakeholders. That's what we're trying to achieve. All right. Now, let's move straight into the four processes of stakeholder management. One, identify stakeholders. Identify stakeholders means you identify the project stakeholders regularly and you are analyzing and documenting relevant information regarding their interests, involvement, and interdependencies. Planned stakeholder engagement takes the information. Look, you cannot plan if you do not know who you're dealing with. You get what I'm saying? So you identify the stakeholders and then you have a better vehicle to plan. If you don't know who your stakeholders are, how are you gonna plan? How are you gonna engage them? You get what I'm saying? So identify, you get your stakeholder register. It becomes an input to plan stakeholder engagement. You plan how to engage them and then you manage their engagement. How do you manage their engagement? By doing what you said you would in the plan. All right, and lastly, you monitor stakeholder engagement. Now, this becomes a rather easy process 
to sum up, monitor stakeholder engagement. Why? Because nothing unique comes from it. You got WPD, of course, going in, and you got WPI coming out, right? But other than that, it's business as usual. You've seen it all before. In fact, you've seen WPD and WPI before. So if I was going to unceremoniously strike out those that don't need much effort to talk about right now, it would be that and that because you do not really get anything unique from these. The only unique thing in managed stakeholder engagement, apart from the uniqueness of what you're doing, is you have ground rules as a tool and technique, which is a little bit strange because you got ground rules as an output somewhat if you get what I mean, in your team charter somewhat. But ground rules is a tool and technique for this one. Other than that, the ones I really want us to talk about are identify and a little bit of planned stakeholder engagement. And then we'll hear a little bit from Holly, who by the time we get done with this, will be able to speak to us. All right, so here's the breakdown of those four. You got initiating to close the uh, monitoring and controlling, no closing, just initiating plan, executing monitoring and controlling. And identify stakeholders is the one I really want to latch into because it has a very important output, the stakeholder register. All right, so this process identifies project stakeholders regularly and you are analyzing and documenting relevant information regarding the stakeholders. Let's take a look at the ITTOs. The ITTOs in the inputs and the tools and techniques are pretty straightforward. The unique thing from here, or the, the unique things from here are one, your stakeholder register, and two, because you are in initiating and you have change requests, it's rather odd. So pay attention to that. This is the only process of initiating where you have a change request. And it's obviously because you're doing this in iterations. So there could be changes that need to be taken into account. Let's go on to 13.1 and read this account, strange if I may add, account of change request. Page 514 says, during the first iteration of identifying stakeholders, there will not be any change requests. You get that? During the first round, there's no change request, but it says, as stakeholder identification continues throughout the project, new stakeholders or new information about stakeholders may result in a change request to the product, project management plan, or project documents. What? Did you just say I need a change request in some instances for project <clears throat> documents? Yes. This is what I tell folks. Page 89 is not, one half is those you need change requests for. The other half are those you don't. No, there are some projects you're gonna need a change request to make a change to a document, all right? So keep that in mind. So when you take a look at any process, my friends, you wanna look at the strange inputs, the strange occurrences. We've got another strange occurrence. The project management plan is an input to initiating. How is that? Again, on the first round, you don't have it. On the second round, you're more intelligent in your identification of stakeholders. Your stakeholder engagement plan is in the project management plan. And the PMI tells you it can be considered. You see, that's why I tell you the process groups are just a bucket. The, the process groups are not an order of you have to do this first and then you have to do this. No, 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 it's not. It's just a container to sort out things by categories more than anything else. It is not sequential. So if you look at the inputs to identify stakeholders, you see the project management plan on page 509, it says, the project management plan is not available when initially identifying stakeholders. However, once it has been developed, the project management plan components include communications management plan and stakeholder engagement plan, and those could be relevant to this 
process. All right. We only got a few minutes left, so let's hurry on down to talk about identify stakeholders. We want to identify them early, constantly, and then we want to focus on those stakeholders that need a lot more work of sorts. And then we want to update the stakeholder register. Now, if you remember, we've got the power interest grid. So on the y-axis is power, on the x-axis is interest. We're going to plot these stakeholders according to their power and interest. Now, I often advise people, don't do this at work. Don't put people's real names on because they get weird and they think you're trying to challenge their authority by saying they got low power. All it means is in this particular sphere of the project, they may have low power, but don't use names. I wouldn't advise that. The bottom line here, my friends, for your exam, you got to remember the left quadrant, the bottom left, low power, low interest, monitor them. High power, low interest, keep satisfied. High power, high interest, manage close, and high interest, low power, keep informed. It's important that you know the strategies for these four quadrants. For that reason, I will save it and I will share it with you in the chat. Now, while I do that, let's talk about what you get in the stakeholder register. You get three things in the stakeholder register. And as you can see on the screen, these three things are identification information. This is actually worth remembering. You have identification information, you have assessment information, and you have stakeholder classification. Now the PMI doesn't go very far in breaking down this risk register into a lot of text. Instead, they expect you to be able to figure out what goes in here from the discussions that preceded the output. So it's, it's very scant, to be honest. Now, while you study identify stakeholders, it's also important for you to remember the stakeholder cube. And I want to give you a reminder about the stakeholder cube. The stakeholder cube has three dimensions. And the three dimensions are power, interest, and attitude, typically. When you think about it like this, you got those with a high level of power, high level of interest, and a positive attitude. As you can see on the screen, those that fit this category, we call them, we call them a, oh, this is backwards, I'm sorry. We call them a savior, influential active backer. This is backwards, I'm sorry. But you can see power is going that way, okay? Which is why it's very awkward. Attitude is going that way. High power, high attitude, and high interest. And it's this individual right here. This is called the savior, influential backer, okay? We've got those that have a high level of interest, a positive attitude, but their power is low. This one is called a friend, insignificant active backer. Now, the foes are those that are the negatives, the negatives. So wherever you find the negatives, round about here, tripwire, insignificant passive blocker. We call them blocker because they're trying to block you, see? So there are many different permutations and combinations. They've been given rather colorful names. You don't need to know the names for the exam. The bottom line is that you need to know what the stakeholder cube dimensions look like. So if I was gonna do this, I would make this my power, this my interest, and this axis coming out my attitude. So anyone here has a positive attitude, right? And anyone behind, if I was gonna draw a line behind, the folks that are behind, which I will make blue, these are the negatives because they got a bad attitude. Remember, this is attitude. This is positive attitude. This is a negative attitude. So these that are on this face, they are all negative. So you can have someone with a high level of power, high level of interest, and a negative attitude. Those are dangerous. You've got to be aware of them. And that is the concept pretty much. Now, in addition to this, I also want you to remember the salience model. The salience model is talked about, but not in a lot of detail in the PEMBOK guide. The salience model 
looks at power, urgency, and legitimacy. And those in the intersection of power, urgency, and legitimacy, we call them definitive stakeholders. Definitive stakeholders, all right? So going a step further to round this up before we hear from Holly, we look at the salience model. We have various classifications. Again, I am going to save the screenshot because this is not in the PMBOK guide and I'm going to share it in the chat. And you can always ask a friend if you're not able to see pop-ups. But it is worth taking a look at and understanding power, urgency, and legitimacy. And number seven, you want to remember, is definitive stakeholders. There's actually a long white paper on this on PMI site. Let's not get into that. That may be overkill. All right. Here's a quick question just to jog your memory on some of the things we have read in this chapter. Here is your poll relaunched. To increase the chances of achieving project success, the project manager should do all of the following. Uh-oh, I'm showing you the answer. That's no good. That is no good at all. <laughs> that is no good. And I'm showing you the answer on this one again. Well, that's a bonus. That's a bonus. Let me give you a different question where I have more intelligently positioned the questions. Here we go. All right. And let me give you your poll. There it is. Take a stab at this. I'll give you a minute, 12 seconds. It seems like I did it again. Apparently, I'm not seen properly today. <laughs> this was not intentional. It was not intentional, honestly. All right, why don't we just call this quits for now? Because I obviously have the answers inadvertently sprinkled. I got to give you a, an intelligent one. Let me do this again. Forget that question. It explains itself. Let's do this one more time. All right, here we go. And here is your question. The key benefit of this process is that it maintains or increases the efficiency and effectiveness of stakeholder engagement activities as the project evolves and its environment changes. Which process does this describe? Now I've got to give you 30 seconds because we're out of time pretty much. Ten seconds. Five seconds. Three, two, and one. All right. Well, let's go over to where the answer is. I want to read it for you. Page 530. Let's end the poll. Share the results. This is why the key benefits need to be read. It can be a little bit tricky. Monitor stakeholder engagement is the process of monitoring project stakeholder relationships and tailoring strategies for engaging stakeholders through modification of engagement activities and plans. The key benefit of this process is that it maintains or increases the efficiency 
and effectiveness of stakeholder engagement activities as the project evolves and as its environment changes. So the answer to this, my friends, is D. All right. Make sure you go through the videos, watch all those videos, and get good with this stuff, all right? For those of you who have asked for it, I know some of you who are in the Monday, Wednesday, Friday class that is now over, some of you have asked, are we going to have another tech camp? Yes, we are going to have another tech camp for the remaining chapters, and that will be announced sometime towards the end of middle to the end of August, maybe on the tail end of our current Saturday friends. But it will be announced, and those that want to take part in it, they'll be able to get it at a crazy, ridiculously low rate. All right? But that will be in August. So stakeholder management, communications management, resource management, integration, and procurement. Yes, we will be having another tech camp for that. All right? Thank you very much, my friends. It's that time where we have come to the end, but I want to answer any chats that came in so let's see <laughs> i gave you the answer i know i'm very generous today all right so the answer was right there on the screen the question that i asked you at first so it's pointless showing you that right now all right let's see if holly is here to talk to us i am here is holly here to talk to us Yes. Holly? Holly? Let's unmute Holly. Oh, Holly. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Hi, how you doing? Good. How are you? Very, very good. How was your meeting? Your meeting before this meeting, or should I say parallel meeting? <laughs> it was good. Uh, the CEO had to run through some stuff uh, with some clients, so I had to be there. Lovely. I hope your CEO recognized that you're now a PMP guru. Better <laughs> recognize, better pay obeisance to the PMP guru. Did, did your CEO recognize your efforts? No, but <laughs> I'm sure they will eventually. <laughs> Very unserious. But do they know, though? Do they know what you did? Uh, my supervisor does, yes. Lovely. It's a huge accomplishment, I tell you. It's a huge accomplishment. So um, your friends are all on the call. I asked you to come because of them. These are your, your colleagues, your friends who have been on the journey with you. So what do you have to say to them? I was going to say I absolutely appreciate all of you, and I've... Uh, yeah, I've heard so many people get on our calls and I get so jealous that they are the ones that are talking with Phil and talking with the class. And it's like, I want to be that person. So I'm very happy that it's over and I'm extremely relieved. And a few of you have reached out and asked me questions, which I don't mind at all, whether it's through the Facebook group or through LinkedIn or anything, feel free to reach out to me. But I really do appreciate everything. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. And honestly, whenever anyone gets certified, it just makes us feel more and more capable that we can actually do it when you hear the good news. And, and that's why I wanted you to come on here today. Just give, you know, just a, a, a little bit of encouragement, maybe run through, because I know you've done this before, but they weren't here. Of course, they, some of them have watched it, but they were not here. And if there were any questions, because I know people had questions. I don't know if you watched my video today. I put up a video today where when I played it back, folks were asking questions. I'm like, well, Holly isn't here. I'm just going to answer for Holly. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up, I ended up uh, you know, answering the questions um, for you. And it, it, was, it was nice, but it wasn't the same as having the actual you know, the person who passed the exam. And, right. you know, that's why I wanted us to do this very quick for a few minutes. I'm actually going to stop the recording from the actual session. And then I'm going to start the little lessons learned you have. I know that you're in the middle of the workday. I don't want to, to bother and disturb. 
But um, if we can do a really quick Q&A just to get some of the questions people had, that would be yeah. awesome. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah definitely.